Hi. Hi again. We're into J.C. Ryle's Expository Thoughts on the Gospels. This is the volume on Matthew and Mark. Mm -hmm. Still published in hardcover and softcover and free on internet. Mm -hmm. These expositions were written from the 1840s into the 1860s, I, I do believe. And at the time, the King James was the translation that almost everybody used. Mm -hmm. But we're reading this section of Matthew 1, 8, 8, 18 to 25 from the NIV. NIV. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. He uh, commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. And Ryle's comment on this. These verses begin by telling us two great truths. They tell us how the Lord Jesus Christ took our nature upon him and became man. They tell us also that his birth was miraculous. His mother Mary was a virgin. These are very mysterious subjects. They are depths which we have no line to fathom. They are truths which we have not mind enough to comprehend. Let us not attempt to explain things which are above our feeble reason. Let us be content to believe with reverence and not speculate about matters which we cannot understand. Enough for us to know that with him who made the world Nothing is impossible. Let us rest in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. Let us observe the conduct of Joseph described in these verses. It is a beautiful example of godly wisdom and tender consideration for others. He saw the appearance of evil in her, who was his espoused wife, but he did nothing rashly. He waited patiently to have the line of duty made clear. In all probability he laid the matter before God in prayer. He that believeth shall not make haste, says Isaiah 28 verse 16. The patience, the patience of Joseph was graciously rewarded. He received a direct message from God upon the subject of his anxiety and was at once relieved from all his fears. How good it is to wait upon God. Whoever cast his cares upon God in hearty prayer and found him fail. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, verse 6. Mm. Let us observe the two names given to our Lord in these verses. One is Jesus, the other Emmanuel. One describes his office and the other his nature. Both are deeply interesting. The name Jesus means Savior, it is the same name as Joshua in the Old Testament. It is given to our Lord because he saves his people from their sins. This is his special office. He saves them from the guilt of sin by washing them in his own atoning blood. He saves them from the dominion of sin by putting in their hearts the sanctifying spirit. He saves them from the presence of sin when he takes them out of this world to rest with him. 
He will save them from all the consequences of sin when he shall give them a glorious body at the last day. Blessed and holy are Christ's people. From sorrow, cross, and conflict they are not saved, but they are saved from sin forevermore. They are cleansed from guilt by Christ's blood. They are made meet for heaven by Christ's spirit. This is salvation. He who cleaves to sin is not yet saved. Jesus is a very encouraging name to heavy-laden sinners. He who is King of kings and Lord of lords might lawfully have taken some more high-sounding title, but he does not do so. The rulers of this world have often called themselves great conquerors, bold, magnificent, and the like. The Son of God is content to call himself Savior. The souls which desire salvation may draw nigh to the Father with boldness and, and have access with confidence through Christ. It is his office and his delight to show mercy. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay, I, I think I read into yours, sorry. <laughs> Jesus is a name which is peculiarly sweet and precious to believers. It has often done them good when the favor of kings and princes would have been heard with unconcern. It has given them what money cannot buy, even inward peace. It has ceased or eased their weary consciences and given rest to their heavy hearts. The Song of Solomon speaks the experience of many when it says, Thy name is as ointment poured forth. That's Song of Solomon 1 verse 3. Happy is that person who trusts not merely in vague notions of God's mercy and goodness, but in Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. Greedy. Okay. The other name in these verses is scarcely less interesting than that just referred to. It is the name which is given to our Lord from his nature, as God manifest in the flesh. He is called Emmanuel, God with us. Let us take care that we have clear views of our Lord Jesus Christ's nature and person. It is a point of deepest importance. We should settle it firmly in our minds that our Savior is perfect man as well as perfect God, and perfect God as well as perfect man. If we once lose sight of this great foundation truth, we may run into fearful heresies. The name Emmanuel takes in the whole mystery. Jesus is God with us. He had a nature like our own in all things, sin only accepted. But though Jesus was with us in human flesh and blood, he was at the same time very God. We shall often find, as we read the Gospels, that our Savior would be weary and hungry and thirsty, could weep and groan and feel pain like one of ourselves. In all this we see the man, Christ Jesus. We see the nature he took on him when he was born of the Virgin Mary. But we shall also find in the same Gospels that our Savior knew men's hearts and thoughts, that he had power over devils, that he could work the mightiest of miracles with a word, that he was ministered to by angels, and that he allowed a disciple to call him my God, and that he said, before Abraham was, I am, and I and my Father are one. And in all this we see the eternal God. We see him who is over all, God blessed, forever. Amen. And that text is Romans 9, 5, by the way, in most translations. Mm. God who is over all, blessed forever. Would you have a strong foundation for your faith and hope? Then keep in constant view your Savior's divinity. He in whose blood you are taught to trust is the Almighty God. All power is His in heaven and earth. None can pluck you out of His hand. 
If you are a true believer in Jesus, let not your heart be troubled, troubled or afraid. Would you have sweet comfort in suffering and trial? Then keep in constant view your Savior's humanity. He is the man, Christ Jesus, who lay on the bosom of the Virgin Mary as a little infant and knows the heart of a man. He can be touched with the feeling of your infirmities. He has himself experienced Satan's temptations. He has endured a hunger. He has shed tears. He has felt pain. Trust him at all times with all your sorrows. He will not despise you. Pour out all your heart before him in prayer and keep nothing back. He can sympathize with his people. Let these thoughts sink down into our minds. Let us bless God for the encouraging truths which the first chapter of the New Testament contains. It tells us of one who saves his people from their sins. But this is not all. It tells us that this Savior is Emmanuel, God himself, and yet God with us, God manifest in human flesh like our own. This is glad tidings. This is indeed good news. Let us feed on these truths in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I think we can safely say there will be dozens, if not hundreds, of people who watch this video who will resist a lot of Ryle's yeah. convictions here. And of course the idea that Jesus is God is not easy for Jehovah's Witnesses, impossible for Jehovah's Witnesses to accept, but it's not easy for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses to get their minds around. Mm -hmm. But before we get mm -hmm. to that, the, the names here, I know you took uh, you took some interest in what he says right at the beginning. Yeah, I, I thought this <clears throat> was worth repeating. He says, Let us not attempt to explain things which are above our feeble reason. Let us be content to believe with reverence and not speculate about matters which we cannot understand. So to me, the, the contrast between the way he's approaching scripture and the way Russell approached scripture. In his first book, he, he, he tells you that he approaches it with his reason. If it doesn't seem reasonable to him, he's going to reject certain things. Mm -hmm. But we're not to take reason, our human reasoning, to God's word. That's, you know, that only results in us speculating. So he wants to take making wrong interesting contrast, reverence. Yeah. You take reverence and realize there's a lot of things that are mysterious and beyond our understanding. There and he's should, talking about the virgin birth here. Yeah, that there, we should, we don't have to know the mechanics of things. And, and that's the thing that usually you're pressed on. Yeah. But we should have humility and trust. And that's why this chapter is so important because, well, again, the stumbling blocks for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses will be, well, Christendom is making too much of these names. Well, well, well do we understand why they make so much of... Mm -hmm. The first chapter of the New Testament mm -hmm. gives two names to Jesus. One is Yeshua, Jesus, mm -hmm. which means, fully spelled out, salvation of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And the other one is Emmanuel. Now the first one, mm -hmm. Yeshua, yeah. is y the salvation of Yahweh or Jehovah, but what does Matthew do with it? Yeah, so I think some people will say, well then Joshua had that name. But, but I think uh, what it says in verse 21 here, it says when they're telling, him, uh, telling them to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So it's not that he's the means of salvation. It's saying he will save them from their sins. Your orthodox theology, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, is that Jehovah used Jesus to save yeah. people from their yeah. sins. But no, who gets the credit? Who's the Savior? Yeah. And so what does a Jewish mind do with the fact that now Jesus is being t said to be the Savior? of his own people. Well, they get very upset and think this is this is claiming to be God. Well, that's right. Yeah. So <laughs> they, they want to they they kill him. So, yeah, in, in the very first name, the name of Jesus, there's mm -hmm. a problem for people who deny the deity of Christ, i.e. Yeah. He is credited be, being the Savior. And you know what yeah. the book of Isaiah says about, well, Jehovah boasts, I yeah. am their Savior and no one else. So they didn't have a problem with him having the name, but when he started to say that he could forgive sins, yeah. they got excited, right? They sure did. 
Yeah. And then there's the name Emmanuel, also from Isaiah. Which is God with us. Or with us is God. Mm -hmm. And Christians for 2,000 years have taken that at face value. Mm -hmm. And therefore I think the minimum we can do with those who accept the deity of Christ is say, I can see your point. Yeah. You don't have to accept their interpretation. Mm -hmm. But the point is right in the first chapter of the yeah. New Testament. I think for, for ex-witnesses, the first step is is not uh, just believe whatever anyone tells you. <laughs> Nobody's going to ask you to do that. So it's understandable that you would resist thinking in a different way. But my suggestion is try and understand why Christians believe what they believe and try and see what they see. I know that they don't always see what we see as ex-witnesses or as witnesses. That, but one flaw doesn't make it okay for us to, to have the same flaw. We should always be trying to understand the other person's point of view and why they believe what they believe and look at their strongest arguments. Yep. That's, that would be my suggestion. Well, these are two pretty strong arguments. Mm -hmm given by Matthew in the very first chapter of the New Testament. Next time, well, we are going to link something this time, <laughs> and that would be uh, J.C. Ryle's book on holiness. The very first video we shot over two years ago was from a Ryle book, which we both loved. Mm -hmm. J.C. Ryle holiness. So we'll put that link on your screen. And next time, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> what about those magi? Mm. Were, they Were they sent by Satan? Mm. Or by God?